Welcome everyone to the 2023 Melbourne Centre for Law and the Environment Annual Forum. My name is Ben Nelson. I'm an Associate Professor here at the Law School and Director of the Centre. Before I give an introduction to the Centre and do a little bit of scene setting uh, for today's forum, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we're meeting today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I also want to recognise that we are paying our respects at a time which is difficult for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and that as we, as a centre, navigate our way through some challenging environment-related issues, we are doing that alongside First Nations peoples who have always been the custodians of these lands and waters. So the Melbourne Centre for Law and the Environment is the next incarnation of one of the University of Melbourne's longest running research centres. Uh, up until a few months ago, we were the Centre for Resources, Energy and Environmental Law, CREAL, a name that the centre had had for lots of years. But as the centre has grown over the past few decades, we now encompass academics and graduate researchers, including some of you in the room, who are doing an incredibly broad range of work. So not just work in resources and energy and the environment, also relating to ind Indigenous rights and interests, climate action, animal rights, disaster law, and lots of other areas. So throughout our work, our common theme is a link with the environment. And our members voted to change our name earlier this year to recognise that breadth of work. So this is our first in-person uh, event as the Melbourne Centre for Law and the Environment. And for us, it really marks a renewed commitment to uh, collaboration with those outside the university as well as those across campus. The topic of today's forum reflects our aspirations to make connections across different areas of law, different jurisdictions uh, and different disciplines. So around the world and around Australia, we've seen a real explosion of contexts where we see offsets being used. And they might be called different things. It might be mitigation or compensatory mitigation or banking or offsets. Uh, but the common feature here is this idea that we can neutralise something that we do that takes away from a desired environmental condition by doing something that promotes that desired environmental condition. That's sort of the, the baseline common theme. So we see offsets in incredibly diverse contexts in incredibly diverse places, from air pollution in China to water quality on the Great Barrier Reef to fisheries in Canada, wetlands in the United States, the preservation of open space in Italy as well as the context that we're probably a little more familiar with in Australia, being carbon offsets and biodiversity offsets. The problems that have attended these kinds of regimes have really often been in the spotlight in the public in Australia in particular. So we've had auditors general in both Victoria and New South Wales uh, scrutinise each of these states' native vegetation or biodiversity offset schemes in New South Wales, we saw a recent and fairly damning Senate inquiry on the topic. At the Commonwealth level, we've seen Senate committees that have pointed to problems with environmental offsets and water offsets. Uh, one of the examples of that recently is the Sustainable Diversion Limit Adjustment Mechanism, which is used in the Murray-Darling Basin. Earlier this year, some of you may have attended a seminar held by Melbourne Climate Futures where they posed the question, are nature-based carbon offsets based on good science? And to paraphrase the answer, it was broadly not really. So the controversies and also the potential that's associated with offsets means there are a huge range of researchers across STEM and HAS disciplines that are looking at this issue. <coughs> there have been relatively few conversations across different offset contexts, say carbon offset people talking to water offset people, talking to biodiversity offset people. And that's despite what we think is a growing policy need to improve offset regimes and avoid the replication of known problems, which brings us to today. <laughs> 
So today's forum is what I hope will be the opening of a conversation across different offset contexts and jurisdictions. We won't necessarily land on answers, but I'm hoping that we can start a continuing discussion that can produce useful lessons by looking across these different contexts and across different jurisdictions. So our panellists will provide us with a really wide field of vision across carbon and biodiversity, and I'll come to water in just a second. We're first going to hear from David Takash, who is Professor of Law at the University of California Law in San Francisco. In addition to a JD, he holds an LLM from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and a Bachelor of Science in Biology, Master of Arts, and a PhD in Science and Technology Studies from Cornell. His scholarly work looks at carbon offsetting, biodiversity conservation law and public trust doctrine, the human right to water and rights of nature. He is the author of the book, The Idea of Biodiversity. And in 2017, he received the Rutter Award for Outstanding Teaching at UC Hastings, where he currently holds uh, the John and Lillian Hastings Research Chair. After David, we will he hear from Joanna Droll, who is Executive Director at Pollination. Jo has over 12 years of experience acting for clients on matters that include climate change and energy law and policy. And before joining Pollination, Jo was a legal advisor in the energy and carbon sectors, advising developers, off-takers, financiers, and corporates on renewable energy and carbon projects. She has also advised on matters concerning international law, including the Paris Agreement, Jo has a Master's of Law from Columbia University, specialising in climate change and energy law, and has been recognised as a James Kent Scholar. She was also a 2016 finalist for the Thomson Reuters Trust Law Lawyer of the Year in recognition of her work on the Paris Agreement. Our third panellist, uh, Professor Sue Jackson from Griffith, Griffith University, has unfortunately fallen ill and can't be here today. Her remarks would have been focused on the context of offsets used to deal with water issues in the Murray-Darling Basin, where she's done extensive work, especially alongside First Nations communities. Because she can't be here, uh, we'll have a little more time for discussion, and I'm hoping some time for you, our audience, both in person and online, to share some of your experiences in diverse offset contexts. So we're going to turn first to hear from David and Joe for about uh, 20 minutes each to hear about offsets in the context and the jurisdictions that they work in and about the pitfalls and the promise that they see. And then before we move on to audience discussion, I'll give them the opportunity to respond and reflect on comments made by the other. And uh, then we'll have plenty of time for audience discussion. So for our online audience, um, please put any questions that you might have in the Q&A function and feel free to upvote questions that you see and we'll try and get through uh, the questions that most people want to hear about first. So with that, I'll turn over to David to start us off. Thanks. So I have no idea what anyone knows or what level to pitch this, but I figure no one will understand my accent anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So, okay, we are going to do an overview of biodiversity offsetting here. So in biodiversity offsetting is when any jurisdiction allows degradation of a legally protected species or ecosystem in exchange for an offset somewhere else. And it's really hard to get accurate figures on where biodiversity offsetting is happening. It's happening in like about 40 something nations with another 50 or 60 in development right now. There's more than 13,000 offset projects that have been approved and implemented. And we're looking at a size at 150,000 square kilometers. So this is actually happening all over the world. A little bit about where this comes from, Rebecca mentioned very briefly, in the late 70s, early 80s, as part of the US Clean Air Act, the U.S. started to engage heavily in compensatory mitigation for wetlands destruction. Currently in the U.S., that's about a $3 billion a year industry. And there are three different types of how that mitigation happens in the U.S., which again has will be familiar to all of you. Either the permittee, the developer themselves, can do the mitigation. The They can pay fees to the government who then does the mitigation, or there are private private mitigation comp compensatory offsetters who that is their profession they do the mitigation 
Based on that, in 1990, around re uh, revisions of the Clean Air Act in the United States, there was a very successful, one of the only major successful experiments in doing offsetting anywhere where uh, sulfur dioxide pollution from the Midwest was flowing to the Northeast of the United States with powerful constituents and destroying lakes, destroying life in various different lakes. The United States Environmental Protection Agency began a system of cap and trade of this one gas sulfur dioxide, and it was very successful in reducing sulfur dioxide emissions through a trading and offset mechanism. Based upon that, Joanna is going to talk more about worldwide carbon trading. If you can trade one ton of uh, sulfur dioxide for another ton of sulfur dioxide, then maybe you can trade one ton of carbon for another ton of carbon. Based upon that, we engage and continue to engage in a multi-billion dollar industry in reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. The idea that you can offset carbon emissions, usually in the global north, but not exclusively, in exchange for encouraging tree planting or avoiding deforestation often in the global south because tons of carbon are fungible. From that, we get the idea that, well, if you can do all of that, then maybe you can trade forms of life for other forms of life. I'll show you one slide from the World Bank, which covers some of the main ideas in biodiversity offsetting. So for the protection and conservation of biodiversity, the mitigation hierarchy includes biodiversity offsets. A biodiversity offset should be designed and implemented to achieve measurable conservation outcomes that can be resulted in no net loss or preferably net gain. The design of an offset must adhere to the like for like or better principle, and you need experts to make all of this work. Let's unpack a little bit of that. So the mitigation hierarchy is often used in biodiversity offsetting law. First, you should avoid harming biodiversity where you can. Where you can't, you should try to reduce your impact of biodiversity. And what you can't reduce, you should offset, you should compensate for by trading the destruction for an offset somewhere else. Some of the other ideas from that World Bank slide, this all has to be measurable. You need complicated metrics to make this worth. There are debates about whether you're looking for no net loss, so biodiversity stays the same, or are you trying to get a gain for biodiversity through this kind of offsetting? The idea of like for like or better, you should be trading one form of life for the same form of life, or perhaps for a habitat or species that's even more imperiled or endangered than the thing that you're destroying. And you need external experts. This has to be science-based. So briefly, obviously, this has been controversial and continues to be controversial. So quote I like from a professor at the University of Western Australia, to me, it's akin to some guy going to that art gallery and pointing at the Mona Lisa on the wall and saying, sorry, mate, we need that bit, so the Mona Lisa has to go, but we'll paint you another one. So for people who don't like this, the idea is that individual forms of life are not fungible. You can't trade life for life. You cannot and should not replace a complicated ecosystem. People look at the kind of metrics that are used. George Monbiot says these figures, ladies and gentlemen, are marmalade. They are finely shredded, boiled to a pulp, heavily sweetened, and still indigestible. In other words, they are total gibberish. We'll get back to that. If you have a law like your EPPC law that is working, we'll get back to that as well, why undermine that? Isn't this just a license to trash nature? There are those who feel that biodiversity should not become just another commodity. Are we just reinforcing the whole capitalist system that's destroying biodiversity in the first place? So what is the opposing argument that seems to be winning the day because of the spread of biodiversity offsetting? A proponents say, well, you should never waste a good crisis. Given the cataclysm and the annihilation of species loss around the world, rates of species diminution that's 1,000 to 10,000 times what it would be without human intervention, combined with the cataclysm of climate change, we urgently need new tools. The tools that we were using for biodiversity conservation were not working effectively. So if biodiversity is priceless, that can mean it literally has no price. So perhaps we should hijack capitalism to put a price on biodiversity so it can, can actually compete in the marketplace. For developers who complain about the green tape of environmental regulations, having a streamlined system of offsetting can reduce the green tape of development. 
And again, we might want millions of dollars for biodiversity conservation, but where does that money come from? Biodiversity offsetting has provided billions and billions of dollars thus far for biodiversity conservation. Whether or not that conservation is effective or not is another question. And the program actually may work, but it's going to depend on a system, a very complicated system of monitored, planned, land use mapping. Obviously, to make it work, we have to specify what we value and how much we value and how we divide, how we consider the ratio between the need for development versus the need for biodiversity conservation. And we need to specify in the law who needs to do what, when they have to do it, and who gets to do it. So for this system to work, every biodiversity offset law has to specify at least four different variables. The first is space. You have to specify how far from the original destruction may or must the offset be. You have to figure out what the service area is for an offset. Is it a government entity? So do Victoria offsets have to be in Victoria? Or can they be somewhere else in Australia? Or is it some subunit of Victoria where the offset has to be? Are you using ecological criteria? Some kind of ecosystem within the same ecosystem, within the same habitat type, the offset should be provided. Is it just what people want wherever that is where people might want it? Do you have certain priority spaces that you either ban from offsetting or that you prioritize for offsetting, for example, connectivity corridors between habitat types, where you're going to channel the conservation money that you otherwise might not have. In addition to space, you have to look at time. <clears throat> what has to be done before you allow for destruction of a listed species or a protected habitat? Is a plan enough? Is a contract for something enough? Do you have to have the offset secured if it's an avoided destruction uh, offset? Does that have to be guaranteed? If it's a nature restoration, you're creating habitat that otherwise wouldn't exist. Do you have to do that before you allow the destruction? And for how long do you have to maintain the offset? Is it for the life of the project, whatever that means? Is it in perpetuity? If it's in perpetuity, do you have financial arrangements to make sure that that happens? You then, the third variable is you have to specify type. What are you trading for something else? Species for species, habitat type for habitat type. How do you measure the habitat type? Is it measured simply in hectares lost for hectares gained? Can you use improved management? We were not doing a good job managing this habitat for blah, blah, blah. And now we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. And that is your offset. You always have to have like for like, the same species for the same species, the same habitat for the same habitat. Or can you trade up something that is vulnerable, perhaps for something that's critically endangered, even if it's not the same exact thing? And are there any no-go red flags, habitat or species that simply can never be offset? And then destruction is almost always permanent. The biodiversity offset isn't necessarily going to work. Sometimes species fail to read the contract that they're under and don't do what the planners actually want them to do. <laughs> so what do you, what's the ratio of lost land or lost species to what you're actually providing in the offset. And you need some kind of metric that makes this system work. What's the quantity of area? What's the quality of what you're providing? How significant or imperiled is what you're losing versus what you're gaining? And how risky is the actual offset? What's the likelihood it's going to succeed? And you have to have some kind of metric to allow this fungibility to happen. And again, a problem that's going to, that Joanna will talk about probably for carbon offsets as well, is what you're doing genuinely additional to what otherwise would have occurred. That is to say, if no one was going to develop the land for the offset in the first place, if it was going to be preserved and you're allowing destruction somewhere else, then all you've done is allowed destruction. You haven't really offset anything effectively. Finally, you have to specify personnel. Who's doing what? 
who must purchase an offset in exchange for their development? Who is permitted to provide an offset? Does the, does the developer themselves get to provide the offset? Is this strictly a government function that they're the ones that are channeling the money? Do you foment an industry of private offset brokers or providers that this is their specialty? And for the system to work, and this has been one of the shortcomings of biodiversity offsetting, you need someone who's measuring, monitoring, reporting, and verifying that the biodiversity you're offsetting is doing what it's contracted to do, that the habitat is robust, that the species are actually there. Finally, one of the criticisms of biodiversity offsetting is that it's often not transparent. So you need to be able to name who gets to weigh in, comment, monitor, prevent, promote the offset itself. So I think what people in Australia maybe don't realize is that you are the global leader. And if you're looking for lessons from somewhere else, it's really everyone is looking for you because you've been doing this for longer than anyone else. And that many, not only is the Commonwealth doing this, but many of the states have their own biodiversity offsetting laws. You've made all the mistakes that there are to make so the rest of the world can look to you and learn from your mistakes. Um, <clears throat> I think people probably know this, but in the October 2020 review of the EPBC Act, offsets were one of the many, many criticisms that came up. So changes are required to the policy to ensure that offsets do not contribute further towards environmental decline. And the report wants there to be a national environmental standard developed for offset. They have to align with other kinds of land and social planning. They should be ecologically feasible. And you should have a more robust uh, uh, system of monitoring and measuring what's going on. The government responded to the Nature Pro Positive Pro Plan in 2022, better for the environment, better for business. And the government commits itself to <laughs> stopping offsets contributing to environmental decline, including developing a national environmental standard in terms of spending lots more money, including having much more transparency and someone in government monitoring what's going on, committing themselves to doing that. 2023, just recently, you have a nature repair market bill that takes some of the criticisms and the promises of the 2020 report and is attempting to set up a system of nature repair. So the time right now in Australia to have this conversation is, is right now. In addition, there is a growing voluntary market. Uh, biodiversity advocates often have uh, climate change envy because you have all kinds of systems in climate change law for people that want to reduce greenhouse gases. You've got a robust multi-billion dollar annually uh, uh, voluntary market in carbon offsetting. There's not the same thing in voluntary biodiversity offsetting. So you've got organizations like wilderlands.earth that if you want to be biodiversity neutral, you can contribute and save certain square meters of Right now, they have four different protected properties that this is their mechanism that they're using to offset your life. So the same way that Nike or Apple or any individual, when you fly on an, uh, on an airplane or Taylor Swift's concert tour wants to be carbon neutral and invests in carbon offsets, usually trees. So they want to promote the idea that we can all be biodiversity neutral in a voluntary way. Okay. Rebecca asked me to talk to you about the law in the United States, and there it is. Uh, we, we do not have anything like what you've got here in Australia. At the end of the Obama administration, you'll notice the date on this is uh, December 27th, 2016, literally the last days of the Obama administration. They put out a proposed rulemaking to have some kind of overarching compensatory mitigation rules in the United States. And it was actually quite a progressive uh, proposal, really trying to shift to a much more proactive landscape level approach instead of like random, here's one offset, here's another offset, trying to make things on a landscape level so that you're channeling conservation funds to where they're most needed. And then right after that, something really strange happened. And then the Secretary of Interior, Ryan Zinke, threw away the policy saying it's un-American, unlawful extortion. So that's where we were until very recently in the United States. But just a couple of weeks ago, 
the Biden administration has put forward a mitigation policy. It's not an official policy. It's kind of a guidance document. So it's Here's some thoughts that if you're a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, official somewhere out there in the hinterlands and you want to do this, here's some ideas that you should be implementing. There's nothing required. So again, it is trying to say you should be thinking about overall uh, landscape planning. There's a preference for advanced offsets, that is to say offsets that are completed before you allow destruction. And one of the big criticisms is that it has abandoned the idea of net gain for biodiversity and settles for no net loss. Parenthetically, who knows what any of this means given the uncertainty and the metrics that go into the offset. So to me, it's a bit of semantics, but it's sort of saying, it would be nice if when you plan, you think about can you leave biodiversity in a better place than it would have otherwise been. Um, nonetheless, there is a lot of biodiversity offsetting, but it's happening at a very local level with US Fish and Wildlife Service employees who, especially in California, who are brokering deals with individual developers and individual private uh, providers. So here's the Wildlands Company, which is the leading company in California. And they, their business is doing biodiversity offsetting and other kinds of compensatory mitigation. Um, California is a bit like Victoria in terms of it is growing extremely rapidly. Sacramento is a city like Melbourne that isn't going to stop growing anytime soon. So in terms of investing in land that you can restore and then sell to a developer that needs it, it's actually a good business deal. I will show you one such offset. This is called the Farm of the Future, the Sacramento River Ranch, integrating habitat conservation and species banking in a working agricultural landscape. They bought an old farm, a very, very large old farm. And in addition to growing alfalfa and horn, corn and hay, they grow habitat for salmon and they grow habitat for Swenson's hawks and they grow habit. This is a salmon habitat. Again, this is all stuff that they restored before the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service gave them the permission to sell offsets for those who needed it because they were going to be destroying salmon habitat. Mm. Here is the Valley Elderberry Longhorn Beetle, which is one of 14 beetles listed on the United States Endangered Species Act. These are elderberry bushes. Valley Elderberry Longhorn Beetles live their entire lives. They eat, sleep, eat, sleep mate hatch their pupae in these in this kind of habitat. This is beautiful habitat for the beetle. This is what they created. And then the US Fish and Wildlife Service gives them the right to sell credits to developers in the Sacramento Valley, Valley who need this. I've probably done the translations of like feet to meters and dollars to dollars wrong, but, yeah. but this is actually a really lucrative business in the United States. They're making, they're making $100,000 per acre in the United States, providing offsets to developers who need it to offset their beetle uh, destruction. Um, th this is, for me, one of the best models I've ever seen. You have to have a permanent conservation covenant with a monitoring plan that's checked in by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. You ha they have a plan to turn over the land to a local land trust at the end of the offset period. And it fits within the larger recovery plan for the various different species that they are offsetting there. The banker, the private business assumes all liability. And importantly, the mitigation has happened before the government gives them the right to sell the offset. So final lessons. Um, doing this right is much more expensive. It's not just a cheap way to get rid of your environmental biodiversity compliance needs. It's actually really expensive to do this. It's, jo Joanna's gonna talk a little bit about carbon offsetting. This is much more difficult than a ton of carbon here for a ton of carbon here, which is difficult in and of itself. This is difficult and expensive. And we have a chicken and egg pro problem. Does this abet development that otherwise wouldn't happen? Or is the development gonna happen and this is getting the best deal for biodiversity that we possibly can? 
is this just feeding biodiversity into the capitalist law that's destroying the planet? Or is this a savvy use of capitalism to give biodiversity a price through government regulation that helps it compete in the marketplace? Um, <clears throat> one of the problems with biodiversity offsetting is that nature doesn't always read the contract and you need <laughs> ratios of destruction and offset that reflect that kind of uncertainty. You need some kind of system for reporting and measuring and monitoring and verifying. And you need some government oversight regulator to make sure that the broke, the biodiversity offsetter is doing what they say they're gonna do. Perhaps this isn't a long-term permanent solution, but one means of stopgap solution to help us staunch some of the loss of biodiversity, particularly in areas that are going to develop no matter what. Um, it is perhaps in Australia, in the United States, a chance for traditional owners or in other indigenous people in other parts of the world to earn money through sound stewardship for caring for country. I can talk a little bit more about that later. And the time, at least in Australia, given the government's interest and commitment is right now to have the kind of conversations of what your law is actually going to look like and how you're gonna weigh the values literally of development versus biodiversity when you're designing a new environmental offset system. That's that's it. Um, thank you for having me. It's really wonderful. Um, and just, I mean, Dave, thank you for that presentation. I think you know, it's very thought provoking. Um, I wish as you were talking, I had this Venn diagram up because carbon markets are here, biodiversity markets are here, but there's definitely an area where they're overlapping on a lot of similar issues and similar challenges. Um, so uh, just before I begin, though, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land, the Wurundjeri people, I don't know if I've got the pronunciation that correct, um, just like to quickly acknowledge that they've been the custodians of this land and um, the sort of um, environmental, looking after the environment, the biodiversity and nature of this land for thousands of years before we have. Um, so the angle I'm going to take to this might be a little bit different. Um, so I currently work at an organization called Pollination, um, and we are a specialist climate investment um, and advisory firm. Um, within the firm, we have a law firm, so we have quite a few um, what we like to call refugee lawyers who are trying to do their bit for the climate. Um, we work with governments, we work with private sector clients, um, mostly around the issue of climate, but more and more so around the issue of nature and biodiversity because you just cannot have a conversation today about climate without talking about biodiversity and that whole no net loss concept. We see it creeping into all sorts of conversations at corporate level at um, the governments that we work with. Um, so my, what I do in the organisation is um, in part work with governments to write climate change laws to help hopefully facilitate um, carbon market transactions. Um, and then the other part of what I do is work with sort of corporates um, advising to other sort of strategies that they can um, take to decarbonize. Um, I did want to set the scene a little bit, and I'm, I'm taking on that angle on sort of carbon uh, offsets. Um, but I did want to take a step back and um, potentially kind of zoom out a little bit from the concept of offsets because I think the carbon market, as David has mentioned, you know, it's been around for over two decades and it's really just um, developed in all weird and wonderful manners across the world in different forms. Um, but fundamentally, when I think offsets, they are a form of carbon credit. Um, and when I think of a carbon credit, um, they usually sit in a voluntary market or they sit in a compliance market. There is something that I just realized might be missing on this slide, which is this emerging Article 6 market. Um, which we're definitely seeing develop um, under the Paris Agreement and hoping for some interesting outcomes this coming COP. Um, but that is more sort of the market that's developing at the international level. But for the most part, I think you can categorize your um, market generally into a voluntary market and a compliance market. And in Australia, we're pretty fortunate to have um, a compliance market that's also um, generates actors that also get to use for voluntary purposes. Um, so going back to real basics, and David, this kind of um, in part is one of those areas that overlap. We're pretty lucky that in the carbon space, we have this one-time equals one credit. 
um, concept. And I think in a nature space, it's a lot more difficult to, to measure apples for apples. You're really measuring apples and oranges most of the time. Um, so, you know, at least in the carbon markets, we have this equatable um, sort of formula where you can actually um, make a, a commodity out of it more simply. Still complex, but more simple. Um, so just uh, something to know, I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion and rightfully a lot of heat on uh, particularly the voluntary carbon market. You'll have seen that in the media definitely over the last 12 months. Um, but it is worth zooming out a little bit and noting the opportunities that exist. Whilst the opportunity of that market is, you know, by some estimates about $2 billion worth of um, investment, um, it does sit within a $130 trillion opportunity to decarbonize the globe. Um, so it is one of many tools that will need to be deployed for us to get to net zero for a decarbonized world. Um, and very much uh, my personal view is that the issue of climate change is too great that we cannot actually take any options off the table. You do actually have to think seriously about pulling whatever lever you can pull to get there by 2050, which isn't actually that far away. Um, so uh, the next thing I kind of wanted to cover off a little bit, just to scene set, is um, how carbon credits are generally generated in these carbon markets. So whether they be in voluntary or compliance markets, usually it requires some sort of activity to happen to either reduce or to remove um, emissions from the atmosphere. The ways you could reduce or remove emissions, you know, broadly, I think you can categorize them into nature-based solutions, um, which I believe there was quite a robust conversation around, as well as technology-based solutions. Um, and just on the slide, I've um, incorporated just a, a, a sum of the very many methodologies that you could actually deploy um, to uh, reduce or remove emissions. Um, so I think the, the topic of, well, when I looked at the title of this um, conversation was really around opportunities and challenges. Um, and I guess I kind of wanted to discuss this through um, sort of my experiences, whether they be working with governments or with, with corporates. Um, but certainly the carbon markets have been around for a really long time, um, longer than what a lot of people think it has been around for. Um, and uh, it's interesting where we are now. You've got, you know, you've got various markets like the ETS in Europe. Um, you've got voluntary carbon markets like their own gold standard that have developed. Um, and there's this real effort at the moment globally to kind of um, bring together all these approaches and try and standardize them in some sort of way. And I think nature is still in the early stages of trying to figure out how do you value nature, um, how do you measure nature, and how do you verify. But you know, we're fortunate enough that carbon markets have got to, gone to a point where there are a lot of really real live transactions that happen, um, which enable sort of um, climate finance to flow, which I'll, I'll get into in a second. Um, but there is sort of a, um, at the international level, you, you see it at, through Unidra, um, I'm pronouncing that wrong French pronunciation, um, UNCITRAL, um, a lot of legal bodies looking at how do you harmonize laws, um, how do you harmonize trades. Um, between borders. Um, but irrespective of that, you know, not having that harmonization, the carbon markets have still been able to develop um, over the last two decades. Um, so what I'm seeing, um, you know, when I sat down and had to think about the opportunities and the challenges with carbon credits, um, you know, it, the, there is still a huge opportunity for this to be an effective way to funnel climate finance, particularly to developing countries where actually the impacts of climate change are the greatest. Um, you know, not, not a perfect system, but you can develop this whole development mechanism which was developed under the Kyoto Protocol, and that was um, sort of brought into play uh, early 2000s, so that's to mid 2000s. Um, we've seen billions of dollars flow through that system to deploy renewables, which, you know, on the issue of additionality, um, many and many rights we would argue that renewables are no longer additional, but in certain jurisdictions, I think there is still a case to, to say, particularly in your least developed countries, to say that you do need that additional finance that can be attracted to the creation of the carbon credit to get some of these projects off the ground. 
Um, the challenges though, however, um, particularly, and I see this particularly in the work that I do with governments, um, and I've been working with quite a few governments in the Pacific, um, a lot of my US colleagues um, do quite a bit of work in, in Africa, um, but it is a similar set of challenges in terms of the lack of capability and the lack of capacity. I think it's, you know, you, you, you get down to the nitty gritty with these governments, they're really keen to access carbon markets to support, um, you know, whether it's their climate ambitions or even economic development, but the infrastructure that you actually need to have in place to facilitate these transactions is not actually <laughs> that simple. Um, I, I look back to Australia when we, um, back in the day when we did have uh, a cap and trade scheme proposed and some pretty decent legislation proposed, which unfortunately was part of the collapse. Um, but we did manage to set up some key pieces of infrastructure like registries and tracking and things that, you know, um, the, the methodologies that under which you would be calculating um, your carbon emissions. Um, and then there's the reality that in many of these countries, there's just ge a general lack of human resources. And so bringing up um, knowledge, like sharing knowledge, um, bringing up the capability in that respect does take a lot of time, um, but absolutely worthwhile. Um, I think an interesting example that, um, and it's quite live because I've been thinking of a bit of working on this a bit, um, is some work we're doing with Fiji in the Red Plus context. So Fiji actually, and this is all very public, um, very good mobile, but um, Fiji actually accesses about, I think about $12.5 billion worth of funding um, made available through the World Bank under the Forest Carbon Partnership facility. Um, many acronyms in this place, so FCPF. Mm. Um, and uh, through that funding, they, it's essentially underpinned by carbon credits, but the World Bank is sponsoring Fiji to develop um, Red Plus projects. So trying to get people not to cut down the tree that would have been cut down otherwise for logging purposes, for example. Um, and through that project, you know, it, it, the conversations I've had with people in Fiji around this, it, the capacity building, they've gone on a real journey over several years with how do you draw up a baseline? How do you measure this stuff? How do you actually justify that as additional? Um, and so there is quite a bit of work to be done, and I think it should be underestimated how long it actually takes um, for for these um, markets to develop. Um, another opportunity that I see using carbon credits. Um, I mean, carbon markets have been very successful in um, the development and the support of new project types and methodologies both nature-based and technology-based. I mean, I can't see this slowing down, David. We had this conversation the other day around the train has left the station. So how do we do this in the best way possible? Um, the flip side to bring in new methodologies over time is, I mean, and generally a challenge, I think, for the carbon markets is around making sure that there is market integrity um, and that there is scientific rigor in, in the methodology that underlie a lot of how these projects are created in the first place. And I think when we say integrity, we often think about project integrity, and that is absolutely core cool and absolutely essential that you have things like additionality, you have things that manage permanence, you have things that manage leakage, um, you have things that manage, um, the other thing that's coming in and, and on that side is the, um, so wealth distribution that you see with local communities, um, how you actually facilitate benefit sharing on the ground that actually gets to the local communities. I think investors are getting a lot more sophisticated when they do their due diligence on this process. And certainly it's something we see people, you know, corporates who buy these um, offsets or corporates who must buy carbon credits um, really drill down into. However, the other aspect of integrity that I think is also really important to consider is that buy side integrity. So um, the person ultimately buying these credits, what are you doing with these credits? How do the credits fit within a broader sustainability strategy? Are you using the credits just to offset everything you're doing? Or are you genuinely using the offsets just to get to the things that you cannot actually physically um, avoid or mitigate in some other way. Um, and so that's also really important. Um, and I think from a legal perspective, one thing definitely to what well, a lot of my legal colleagues watch with more interest than others who are not legally inclined, um, it's sort of how you disclose 
um, what you've um, presented and what what you're claiming um, using those in using those offsets. Um, so <laughs> not all offsets are created equal, certainly, but how you also then use those offsets and view them for them with the integrity of the entire market. Um, so I think the last thing that I kind of wanted to touch on um, around opportunities and challenges is that. Uh, and I find this quite interesting um, from some of the transactions that I'm seeing is whilst there is a lot of challenge around, um, and so some of the work, I guess, where this comes from is we, we work with governments to write climate change laws. One of the key legal issues is what is, <laughs> what who owns the credits and how do you document the ownership of that credits? Because for the market to work, you enter the market to gain confidence. You know, that certainty around who owns and who has the ability to transfer those credits is really important um, underlying pretty much all of your transactions. Um, however, the opportunity that I'm really seeing and um, as these sort of more and more projects are coming online with you know, different methodologies, we're seeing new products out there where people like, for example, insurers, we're talking to a lot of insurers in this case are willing to um, take some of the project list and, and really um, the introduction of new <coughs> players into the market to support the transactions, the risk for transactions. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think that is all I really wanted to say about opportunities and challenges, but I'm hoping, I mean, I, I'm conscious of time and that will hopefully left a bit of time because I think there's a few things there, David, that certainly overlaps with what I've talked about, and maybe we'll come at it from slightly different angles. So very much open to questions from the floor. Mm -hmm. um, before we move there, I might just give David an opportunity to put in any additional reflections based on Joe's comments. Um, just a few different things. Um, you cannot take any options off the table. Um, I actually, maybe there are options that you should take off the table, but in this case, really, we have to try just about everything. I actually agree with that. Um, the problems of standardization that you mentioned, it's much easier in carbon than it is for biodiversity, but it's still awfully tough in carbon. Because you can't underestimate the complexity of legal systems that you need to make this work, which makes it even more difficult in the global south. I did a a consulting report many years ago for a major NGO looking at how do you make carbon a marketable, forest carbon a marketable commodity. And when you think about the fact that who owns the trees might be different than who owns the roots underground might be different from who owns the carbon credits might be different from who owns this, that, and the other thing. And you're trying to make this a marketable thing. That's tough enough in Australia, never mind in Indonesia, right? There's, there's going to be so this is really a tough thing to bring up, and that's for carbon, never mind uh, biodiversity. Um, and benefit sharing to local communities is always a problem. And how do you make sure that the benefits, if you're taking, if you have up this major opportunity costs, whether you're doing biodiversity offsetting or carbon offsetting or red plus, if the local community cannot use the forest, for example, as they used to be using it, how do you make sure the benefits actually get to them and don't get trapped? With international consultants or with government incompetence, or yeah, so that's always a problem in any of these. And that issue on marketability is so fascinating because there's so many elements in marketability, right? And so if you go to market, um, people in the market want to see all these things actually happening. Um, some of the bigger corporates who, you know, I think are probably some of the more ambitious ones will really drill down into some of those issues um, and want to see like demonstrable evidence that the people on the ground are actually getting paid, um, not just pittance, but, you know, something that is, because you're right, like you take that land away from them, they can't actually use it for agricultural purposes, which is actually what happens in a lot of lot, many parts of the world. So how do you compensate the landowners to give them, you know, additional um, financial incentive not to cut down the trees? Um, it's 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 all actually quite, um, not as simple as people make it out to be, but certainly I, I don't envy the challenges that are in the, the nature um, space, but we certainly have to, I don't think, because some of the solutions on the table do definitely scare me, but I have to remind myself that we still need to talk about it because of what we are facing between the biodiversity crisis as well as the climate crisis. Well, I'm sure that will spare much discussion, but round of applause for Joe. 
we now have run out of time. So um, last 20 second comment <laughs> from both of you and then we will wrap up. Oh gosh, 20 seconds. Um, hopefully I've given a little bit of optimism <laughs> to the audience. I know like it's, you know, it's, it's hard being in this space sometimes, but I think it is, it is ultimately at the end of the day, important issues that we're dealing with and you know, giving up me is not really an option. Um, so, you know, I, I would encourage people to, you know, try and be a little bit more optimistic. It is, it is definitely um, hard, particularly for the offset space right now. Um, but also don't forget, I think we've come a really long way in terms of decarbonizing. You know, I was looking at stats the other day on how far we've come as a country here and our energy system in terms of you know, reduce their emission intensity by something like 20 percent um, over the last you know since the ramp was in place. So there's definitely positive stories and um, I guess yeah I, I, th there are definitely people that are met along the way that are working really hard to try to fix the issue and doing it in a way that is you know, no, no net, net loss. Because Australia has been the world leader, there's no good deed goes on punished situation where you've made all the mistakes, but there's been very damning reports that have come out on the Commonwealth's plans for biodiversity, uh, uh, execution of biodiversity offsetting on New South Wales, on Victoria's uh, biodiversity offsetting, and all of these governments are committed. They're, they're not saying, oh, well, we're not going to do this anymore. They said, okay, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it better. That is to say, no one in this country seems to be backing away. It's a growth industry. The train has left the station, the rocket is launched, the horses are out of the farm, whatever your tired metaphor is. So the question is, given that the government and the different state and federal governments seem totally committed to this, how do you do it in the best possible way to get the best bargain for biodiversity you possibly can? Seems to me where I would intervene if I were intervening. All right. Well, thank you so much both for sharing your insights. There's clearly huge complexity um, in all sorts of areas, huge questions about the appropriate scope of the use of offsets in time and in space, um, and clearly a lot of work for lawyers and rule designers to be thinking about in this area. So thank you very much both.